Hi, welcome to this lesson about the applications of DNA sequencing, uh, which I think is module 6.3.2 of the OCR uh, A-Level Biology syllabus. So last lesson we looked at um, different ways of doing uh, DNA sequencing. So I just want you to look at these three boxes, these three purple boxes. Uh, and can you just say out loud what, uh, what method each of these boxes, these diagrams represents for the three, me um, three methods of DNA sequencing? And also, could you put them in an order uh, from oldest to sort of newest. Okay, did you do that? So the oldest method was this. This is the original Sanger sequencing method, uh, which uses gel electrophoresis to separate the DNA fragments um, produced by size. Then we come to this one, which is a slightly updated version of this method. It's called automated dideoxy sequencing. Um, and then you get this kind of fluorescent, or the output chromatogram here. And then the newest method is represented by this picture, and this is the pyrosequencing method, uh, which is kind of all to do with flashes of light as nucleotides are added to the chain. So hopefully you've already watched this uh, video if you're in my class, and if not, you should definitely watch it. Uh, it's really, really interesting, and it's about how these newer technologies, uh, which we've developed recently about DNA sequencing, have helped us to sequence the coronavirus in a far, far shorter time than it has taken to sequence any other viral pandemics in the past. Um, so check that video out. I'll put the link uh, just underneath the description. Either watch it now and come back to this video or you can watch it at the end. So we're gonna look at some applications of gene sequencing in this video. Uh, and I'd like you to make notes on the major applications using this video and also page 219 to 220 of your A-level biology textbook. So let's go. First thing, the Human Genome Project. Now, the Human Genome Project was a very, very large project. It took a long time, uh, and it was kind of a monumental project that started um, really delving deeper into uh, the human uh, genetic code and trying to sequence every single letter of that code to figure out you know, what, where the genes are in the code and, and what other regions of the DNA there were, you know, what, what regions were kind of promoter regions that kind of decide whether genes should be turned on or turned off and also working out regulatory uh, regions that kind of control the activity of other genes. So this timeline here underneath was published for the 15th anniversary of the Human Genome Project. And we can see the Human Genome Project really started in 1990. It continued, um, took about, I think, 13 years for the final finished version of the human genome sequence to be completed. Um, and it was, it was quite a sort of compelling, it was kind of a race to complete the genome, there were a couple of different scientists competing using different sequencing methods, methods uh, to kind of finish it off. But it's been a while since we've done that, uh, and this Human Genome Project is still giving us more and more information um, to kind of develop drugs, uh, to treat illnesses, uh, and to understand more about our genetic code. So that's the first application. More about that can be found on page 236 of your uh, textbook. Second application, comparisons between species. This is a really, really interesting, uh, interesting um, way of using gene sequencing. So you can sequence, for example, the human, the gorilla, the chimp, the bonobo uh, genomes, and you can also sequence uh, you know, partial genomes of um, fossils. So there's a type of human ancestor called a Denisovan, uh, which is a group of archaic humans, kind of closely related to the Anderthals, but, um, but, but a little bit different. Um, and what we can do is, having sequenced those uh, ourselves uh, and these primates and this ancestor, we can see how closely related are the, the Denisovans to us and how closely are, are related these other primates. So in this little infographic here, um, kind of red represents difference and yellow represents similarity. So this is just a way of kind of representing the code. You can imagine, if we sort of zoom in on this chimp here, uh, you can imagine that this code kind of snakes around in this kind of wiggly fashion. That's kind of almost like the DNA strand. And places where it's red are differences, and places where it's yellow are very similar. And there's a little um, scale up here as well. So you can see that we are very, very similar to Denisovans, pretty similar to bonobos, still very similar to chimps, uh, but more different from gorillas. And that helps recreate this family tree here, so we can see at what point we uh, kind of diverged from all these different primate species and we can kind of recreate the evolutionary history of our species. So that's comparing between species. Now, 
This also helps us to work out evolutionary relationships, like I've said. In year 12, you will have learned about that. Remember, that's called phylogenetics, um, working out evolutionary relationships through looking at molecular evidence, for example, the DNA sequence. And this is also being used today. In fact, it's a really um, sort of uh, involved area of study because, I'm just going to skip forward actually, because this is the type of information you can get. Now, there's a lot of information on this graph here, but basically, let's zoom into this area, and this is showing us how similar different coronaviruses are to each other. So, as you know, the coronavirus genome has been sequenced, and scientists have been working to figure out where it came from. So you can see that uh, it's very similar to this bat coronavirus here, this, this is called BATCOV RATG13. So it's you know in the sort of 95% similarity at you know, many places along the genome. This is the kind of imagine this is going along the you know large DNA strand that makes up the genome of coronavirus. It's about 30,000 nucleotides long. So using this sort of information, we can again reconstruct a, an evolutionary sort of history of this coronavirus, but we can also and compare it to other coronaviruses. So this is uh, 2019 NCOV. Uh, and we can see that this, this researcher here has actually sequenced a few different samples of this uh, NCOV, and there are multiple variants actually circul circulating. This is obviously a really um, evolving area, uh, so some of this information may well be out of date by tomorrow, but I think currently there's definitely an L strain and an S strain they've identified, um, which shows slight differences. Um, but we believe they both kind of split off from a bat coronavirus, probably this one, which is the closest related bat cov RATG13. So that's a very uh, sort of interesting area at the moment as well. And in terms of um, working out um, even the evolutionary relationships, we can also, I'm just going to go back here, look at this sort of information, which talks about, um, which charts just the development of one gene. So this gene is called FOXP2. And this is a representation of how FOXP2 is similar and different in different primates. Uh, and even though this, this FOXP2 gene is an important gene and it's conserved amongst lots of primates, which means it's kind of an important gene and it does stuff, but there are slight differences in human FOXP2. And scientists now believe that this gene, FOXP2, is the one that one of the genes that enables us to communicate uh, verbally. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if it controls either our processing in our brain or our, our voice box it might be one of, one of the one of the two go research it go find out um, but we can kind of ch chart human evolution through looking at individual uh, genes I do know also that um, this gene if it's mutated in humans can lead to language disorders so we've talked about the human genome project comparing species and working out evolutionary relationships but we can also study variation between individuals of the same species so Something called the SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. And that means that, you know, in the human genome, there are hundreds of thousands of places where, let's say, my genome might differ, differ from your genome in just a few key uh, points. So this is called a single nucleotide polymorphism. And what scientists are doing is they're trying to map out all these single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, and kind of link them to various traits. And we can use this for loads of loads of different reasons. I'll take you now to um, my 23andMe ancestry report. So I've had my genome not fully sequenced, but here's my uh, my genome. Uh, and you can see my sort of ancestry composition. You can look at it. I can sort of view my, view my British and Irish ancestry. And this is all done by sort of analyzing those single nucleotide polymorphisms and working out um, which populations around the world share the SNPs that I share and therefore where are my ancestors from. Uh, so that's my ancestry. I can even see uh, that my, you know, how much of my DNA is uh, coming from Neanderthals, which is typically about 3% in sort of Caucasian Europeans, but it varies. I think I'm a bit less than that. I think I'm about 1 or 2% Neanderthal from memory. Oh, never mind, I've signed out. So let's go back to the, power, to the PowerPoint. Okay, so the other thing that you can do is you can try and predict the amino acid sequence and protein structure using just a DNA sequence. So as you know, hopefully, if you're in uh, year 12 or year 13, that if you have a three, uh, three letters of DNA, we call that a codon, so for example, GCA, 
Now that will code for a certain amino acid. So by reading the sequence of uh, the DNA letters, we can turn that into the sequence of amino acids within a protein. Now we can make the primary structure of the protein fairly simply, but to work out the actual 3D structure when that protein chain kind of folds and coils upon itself to make, let's say, a globular protein, is very difficult. So some of the biggest supercomputers in the world, this one is called Blue Gene L, run by IBM, are actually trying to kind of calculate based on a DNA sequence what the final protein 3D structure would look like and how it would sort of all fold up. Now there's also a really interesting application of this at the moment. If you go to this website, Folding at Home, uh, there is work now being done to try and um, using the coronavirus genome to try and identify all the structures of all its proteins uh, using supercomputers and then potentially to kind of try and search through libraries of different molecules trying to find ones that might interact with those surface proteins of coronavirus and prevent it from entering cells i.e to produce drugs against coronavirus so this this website folding at home basically sends all that data to kind of crunch instead of to one big supercomputer it sends it out to your home computers and i think even your you know xbox or playstation can do this as well um, so if you have free computer time sign up uh, and do your part to try and identify some drugs for this virus that's spreading so the last thing is synthetic biology so synthetic biology is the science of making useful biological devices and systems um, so what does that even mean? That doesn't really give us a huge amount of information. Well, what it is, is it's a, it's a sort of new field of biology that involves basically the fine manipulation of the DNA code. So that can be sequencing it, um, rewriting it, rearranging it, designing it, and building it, and even putting it into life form. So it's really genetic engineering, so to speak, but done with far greater precision. So what's involved in that process? Well, what's involved are these things. Sequencing of the DNA, which we talked about. Understanding what different DNA codes do, so understanding the genes that they, they code for, different DNA segments. Modeling the interactions. Now, this is something that's really um, key. So synthetic biologists try to have two or three or four genes working together and fully understand how they kind of control each other to kind of make um, these kind of modular kind of parts that they can then assemble into larger organisms. So that's what they're trying to do. Um, so in doing so, they design the different parts, the different genes, they put them together in a code and they sort of model it in computers to see if they think it will work. And ultimately they can actually print the code. They can print it using a DNA printer uh, there was mention in the coronavirus video that I hope you've watched at the beginning or you can watch at the end. Um, and by doing that, they can basically build their own DNA code to do pretty much what they want to do. So there's so many different um, ways that this can be used, as shown in this diagram here. It could be used in medicine, in fuels, in all sorts of things. I'll just let you look at some of the different ways that we might be able to use this new technology. One of the key parts of this synthetic biology revolution has been the development of this CRISPR system here. So CRISPR stands for, am I going to get this right, clustered regularly, <laughs> clustered regularly interspersed palindromic repeats. Bit of a mouthful, basically it, it kind of, um, it means that we can now use an enzyme called Cas9 to precisely cut DNA where we want to and insert the DNA, new DNA code where we want to. With previous um, iterations of genetic engineering, it was a bit random where we were cutting and putting new DNA, but now we can really, really be super targeted with this CRISPR, and that's opened up a huge different um, array of different options uh, and technologies. Here's some odd ones. This one is probably the weirdest one. This is called e -chromi. So the idea behind this is that uh, scientists um, engineered some harmless strands, uh, strains of E. coli, which is a bacteria that lives in your intestine, to be different colors. Uh, and they engineered them so they would be different colors in the process of chemical signals. So here the idea was that you basically would uh, drink a bottle of this E. coli drink, much like you drink like a probiotic yogurt. And then um, when you went uh, to, to poo, basically your poo would be a different color. Uh, and looking at your poo um, would tell you if there was anything wrong 
uh, with you will tell you something about the health of your intestines, right? So you might be able to diagnose um, sort of um, irritable bowel disease or you know food poisoning and things to do with that based on the colour of the poo that would come out. So this is an idea called e -chroma. I think it was more of a proof of concept uh, as opposed to like a, a real thing that they thought they were going to do, but it's kind of a funny one. Um, there's also things called like Solar Foods as a company. I think it's Finnish, I think. Uh, and they're working on making food just from sunlight using um, sort of synthetically uh, engineered, uh, genetically modified yeast. Um, and we've also got loads and loads of businesses that are working with synthetic biology to try and build stuff, to try and build chemicals in a more renewable way, biofuels, protein and feed, um, lab stuff, alternative plastics and all sorts. Okay, so there's a huge number of applications in the synthetic biology. Uh, and that's just one of the areas that sequencing can kind of lead to. So what I'd like you to do now is to uh, pause this video and answer the questions on page 220. They're right here. Pause the video and then we'll see how you do when I put the mark scheme up in a second. There you go. So how did you do? Please green pen your answers there um, and add any extra detail that you didn't um, have before. And also what I'm going to set you now is a little bit of follow up work on this. Um, I'm going to set this for you on Teams. Uh, it's a little sheet called Where Do Your Genes Come From? Uh, and it goes into a little bit of depth about DNA sequencing and, and the human genome. So please complete that work and then send a picture, both of the answered questions here and this work to me on Teams. OK, so that's all for our lesson today. But before we go, quick syllabus check. Can you now do the things that you should be able to do? Do you know how gene sequencing has allowed for genome-wide comparisons between individuals and between species? Do you know how gene sequencing has allowed for sequences of amino acids in polypeptides to be predicted? Remember that's because three letters of the DNA code codes for one amino acid, so you can directly translate the DNA code into um, a sequence of amino acids, just like a ribosome does. And how, do you have an understanding of how gene sequencing has allowed for the development of this new field of synthetic biology?